Um, one thing where I did um, a study on multimodal construction grammar or multimodal construct grammar is comparative correlatives. So you have um, sentences like the more complex the topic, the longer the talk, the more you eat, the fatter you get, the more the merrier. <coughs> Pardon me. These are known as comparative correlative constructions. They consist of two clauses. The first clause has a the, a comparative phrase, more complex, and then a clause, the topic is. And then a second clause, the longer comparative phrase, the talk is. And there's a relationship between the two. So the first one is the independent variable or a protasis that causes the second, the dependent variable in the apodosis. So if you eat more, the effect is the cause is you're going to get fatter. So semantically, there is an interesting um, symmetric as well as asymmetric relationship in this construction. The two clauses clearly have an asymmetric relationship because one causes the other, cause and effect, um, protasis apodosis. On the other hand, the comparative part of it, so um, the more you eat, the fatter you get, clause internally have a similar semantics sort of putting it very simply, because both assume that you conjure up a time span during which something increases or decreases. So the more you eat means there's a start and an end, and during that period, your eating increases. And the fatter you get, it's a time frame, start and finish, and your weight is going to increase. It doesn't always have to be increase, increase. Um, the more you own, the less happy you are, but it's the same semantics of start and end and a comparative change. So the construction is symmetric and asymmetric properties, and it started out early Middle English period, some predecessors in the Old English period, as an asymmetric construction that was marked differently with respect to word order and other elements um, in the first and the second clause. And then for various changes in the English language, subject verb um, order that was fixed for uh, main and subordinate clauses, they became more and more similar. So um, to cut a long story short, the history of the comparative correlative in English is one from a more asymmetrically formally marked construction to a more symmetrically marked one. But at the same time, semantically, you still have these two things, the symmetric, where the first and the second construction clause are, are interpreted in the same way, as well as an asymmetric relationship where one is cause and the other is effect. Now, once you've got a construction like that, that combines these things, it's of course interesting to see how speakers conceptualize this using gestures, how they um, create multimodal constructs. This is from a TED talk. Because whether they would meant to or not, my parents left behind a very clear message. The less you own, the more you have. So she says, the less you own, the more you have. The left hand is lex and flat, palm towards center, and it moves away from the center on the first clause. And then in the second clause, you get a symmetric gesture, but this time to the other side. And that's the right hand, palm to center, hand lex flat, and then the hand moves like this. I should probably go like this. Okay, so you can see she splits up the construction into two parts, first clause, second clause. There is a symmetric relationship about it, but at the same time, they, at the same time, they move in different directions. So you could argue that this type of gesture also implies the kind of difference between the two. So she, this kind of message conveys symmetric as well as asymmetric properties in the gesture which fits the constructional description. But is that a, a multimodal construction? Is it entrenched, not just in an individual, um, which is hard enough to find out, but maybe also conventionalized in a speech community? I would argue it's more of a gesticulation. Gesticulation and gesture studies are meaningful gestures, which obligatorily need to accompany verbal language. Think back again to the thumbs up gesture. I can do this and not say anything. And if you know the conventional meaning of it, you know what I'm trying to express. If I do this, however, it could mean tons of things. It could mean on the one hand, on the other hand, some say this, some say that. So it's compatible with multiple meanings. So there is something spontaneous, individual about it, and you need the language, the multimodal construct to interpret it. They are rarely conventionalized, however. So if they were conventionalized, um, um, then it would be a multimodal construction. 
So I don't know. Um, oh, you can't see this with my blue jumper. I don't know. So the shrug, Ellen Schenke has worked on this and said that very often people say, I don't know. You know, they've got a shoulder shrug that accompanies that. And if that always happens or very often, then it's going to be tied into a multimodal construction. But many are not. So how do people construct these multimodal packages? And as I'm sort of saying over and over again, there's more to construction grammar than just constructions, which seems counterintuitive because most construction grammar publications say construction X, construction Y, and language X, Y, Z. Um, these are still important. Long-term associations of form and meaning um, are important constructions, but we also need to think more about how they are combined. So in order to look at the comparative correlative construction, I need a large corpus. And for this, I drew on the red hen corpus um, that Mark Turner and Francis Dean and others are working on. Um, it's a large television corpus. By now, it's got more than 2 billion words of television news. Television news are not sort of just one type of program, because sometimes you also have chat shows on that uh, in the corpus. Um, you have ads, you have people being interviewed spontaneously, but you've also got sort of media pros like news reporters and anchors talking about stuff. Um, but the size is really impressive. You know, if I looked at comparative correlative constructions, the more you eat, the fatter you get. In classical corpora like the Brown corpus um, and its relatives, um, which has got 1 million words each, then for every 1 million word corpus, you only find 40 instances of the comparative correlative construction. And that's the same for the ICE, um, British English corpus, um, flour, uh, frown, flob, you name it. You always get roughly 35, 40, whatever, um, but sort of roughly around this point. I extracted 1,000 tokens um, from um, this particular corpus. Not all of them were relevant, but we're going to end up with way more than you would find in a 1 million word corpus. Um, the query is on that. Um, it uses CQP, um, the interface um, that Peter Ulrich has developed. And you could look at potentially more than 30,000 hits in more than 29,000 um, texts. Um, but all in all, I ended up with this random sample of 1,000 tokens out of which 442 were unique relevant tokens because some were repeated. If you had a rerun of a show, then it would come up twice. And I wasn't interested because I wanted to look at the spontaneous gesture. So each individual instance of a TV show that was repeated was only taken into account once. Now in those 442 instances, very often, just like right now, you can't see my hands. You didn't see the hands of the speaker because they were below the screen or there was like on-screen text blocking um, the view. But then in 100 of those, you could see a gesture or you could see the hands. And in 80% of those, there was a gesture and in 20% there was no gesture. So if you look at this, then of course, it not, it's, not, it's not necessarily the case that there's one multimodal comparative correlative construction stored. But people seem to have the urge to gesture with this construction. And that's, I would argue, is already an interesting point for further investigation. When you then look at what they do, and these are just three broad, broad categories, um, you can see that speakers sometimes have a parallel gesture, which seems to focus on the symmetric part of C1 and C2 are doing okay and the more of us who talk about it the easier it will get because I the more of us who talk about it the easier it will get um both palms are sort of uh, open and facing slightly upwards there's an arc movement outside on both of these clauses you see the symmetrical element um then you get gestures which are symmetric and ask your advisor he knows a lot and the more he's afraid the more he's going to talk the more he's afraid, the more he's going to talk. So um, both hands sort of facing each other and towards the center, the palms are lateral, and he moves to his left and then to his right. In a similar sense, there's a similar gesture on both of the clauses, but they're going in opposite directions. So you can see this asymmetric relationship between the two. But sometimes you also get so-called asymmetric relationships where people don't do the same gesture on both um, clauses, and they don't have a symmetric gesture, but the hands do something different, totally different as in this example. Did you know that the more stress you have, the more likely you are to be obese and the proof here is in strands of your hair? Okay, so let no one um, take your hair. Um, but apart from that, um, on the first 
clause, um, the more stress you have. She has a beat gesture where the rhythm is beat with her index finger. And then on the second clause, the more likely you are to be obese. Both hands are sort of stretched um, and palm lateral towards center, and you still got a beating gesture to the right. Something completely different. Very broad categories. Um, but just to show you the symmetric ones where people did the same gesture on the first and second clause are rare, um, some like 10% of the examples. And in 40%, you got a parallel gesture. So the hands were similar, but moving in different directions. And a different um, gesture was identified in again, more than 40%. So the gestures are highly varied, but what happens is in the linguistic form, the more you eat, the more you, um, the more you gain weight, <coughs> you get a symmetrical uh, marking of first and second clause in English. And in the gestures, at least, you sort of separate them with respect to a either parallel or different movement. So there is at least this kind of tendency. But the gestures vary far too frequently for us to argue that there is one multimodal construction. And I would argue that's not a problem for construction grammar. That's not something we're going to go, oh, it's not a construction, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. No, on the other, uh, completely contrary to this, because if it's not stored, people must do this on the fly. They must combine the semiotic meaning that they want to express in a gesture as well as in a construction. So conceptual blending offers us with a tool, a cognitive tool for analyzing this. For the cognitive semiotic processes in the working memory where existing constructions and spontaneous gestures blend in a creative way. It's going to be motivated by cognitive semiotic principles, as Mittelberg points out, metonymy, anal analogy, and so on. Um, so it's not like we can't explain these, but there's going to be individual instances, and it shows us how thinking blends into these multimodal constructs. And if conceptual blending is so important for the integration of multimodal constructs, it's, of course, an, the next step, and Mark Turner and Jill Fauconier have published lots of papers on that, sh that have shown that you can use conceptual blending to explain novel thoughts, to explain mathematical reasoning. So if that's sort of like a domain general principle, a domain general process, then perhaps it's also the domain general process that is at work in the working memory whenever we combine constructions. So in computational approaches, as I said, you sometimes get the metaphor of unification, combination, however you want to call it. But perhaps that's not the best way to think about this. You've got a complex thought, and what you do is you blend all the gestural and the verbal information from your long-term memory that you put into this construct that you want to express. So they were able to cut the turtle loose, of course, blends in lots of constructions. And if we were to disentangle them, we don't very often do this, but you know, there's a they construction, turtle loose construction. It's again, a resultative, um, they cut the turtle loose, um, and then it's past tense and be able to construction and so on. And the turtle is a noun phrase, so it's definite. You need to know which turtle they're talking about. All of this is part of what's fed into the working memory and which is combined there using conceptual blending. And this is, of course, um, for construction grammar, it's important because constructs are an important window on creative online semiosis of how we combine things into these packages of you're not you when you're hungry in the ad, or in um, the less you own, the more you have, that's I think where it was, with the gesture descriptions. Okay, so as I said, and hopefully now it makes a lot more sense what I'm trying to say, it's not the case that it's just constructions. Okay, constructions play a huge role, but their combination, their creative conceptual blending very often is going to be important too. And if you adopt like a computational approach and a complete inheritance approach in construction grammar, very often, you know, you're only going to have a few constructions and they will combine in a certain way, but you leave out the usage-based aspect of what frequency and specific situations do. And in contrast to this, in usage-based approaches, very often we focus too much on what an individual token does, and then it gets stored, and we talk about constructions being stored from the input. But we leave too little, um, too little space for online constructs in the working memory, which are, however, really important. Okay, so we've seen this um, with gesture constructions and 
um, multimodal constructions. But of course, from a usage-based perspective, once something is novel and useful, appropriate, so to speak, um, then people might pick it up. 